sang at night in the dark together, very lovely. Uh, and then on Christmas morning, uh, we will have a communion service at 10.30 on Christmas morning. And for the fourth Sunday of Lent, I invite you to please rise for our opening hymn.
Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> reading comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, the seventh chapter, beginning with verse 10. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? shall stand in his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not let 
lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, <coughs> he is the King of glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
you the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit and her husband Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame resolved to divorce her quietly but as he considered these things behold an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying Joseph son of David do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, y'all really made me feel good tonight. How many of you, several of you, right here, right now, in this room, you took the time to tell me how fabulous I look <laughs> in this very beautiful surplus. Okay, this is called a surplus. I've been wearing surpluses since I was a kid as an altar boy, growing up in my own parish church. This black, boring garment is called a cassock, but this fabulous embroidered, lacy sort of gig, that's called surplus. And most of my life, most of my career, when I choose to go the route of a cassock and surplus for a Sunday service, I choose plain and cheap. Let me tell you why. Because in my work, I traffic quite a bit in ultramar. And with these sleeves, it's very easy to knock over a chalice or a little tiny plastic cup full of wine, and it gets on this beautiful white garment. And then I feel like I've wasted my money. But all that changed a couple of years ago. Perhaps some of you were here. But I was about to conduct the service of the sacrament, and it was unconsecrated, but I spilled manischewitz all over it. <laughs> Remember that? Some of you were here. And for the rest of the service, I was covered in this big, horrible wine. But then I entrusted this garment to Catherine Peterson who managed to get the wine out of the garment so that it looked brand new. Now that I know it can be done, I have made better investments. <laughs> and I can go to the nicer stuff now. And to this day, I know that if I get wine on any of my garments or any of the altar cloths, I'm sure that there are several people in the church or in the altar guild that can do it. But in my mind, there's one person to go to. I always go to Catherine Peterson. She always saves me. Whenever the, uh, whenever the elders get wine splattered on their owls or their liturgical robes, I always tell them, before we even begin the final hymn of the service, I say, take it to Catherine Peterson. She is the one that can address that problem. And that's kind of cool when there are certain people in the world who can address certain things. For instance, you have an electrical question. Who are you going to seek out? <laughs> Bill Benjamin, where is Bill? Or if you hope Bill's up in the choir. All right. If you have a question about how we might advance the, the woodwork presence of our beautiful sanctuary, who are we going to call on? Don Gagenberger or uh, Billy Caldwell. If we have a question about counsel or counsel proceedings, things like that, who's the one you go straight to? President Don Gagenberger, right? Somebody said, Steve, if you have a problem with the pastor, who do you call? <laughs> Steve McCullough, right? He's the one that you go to. Uh, so we have people who are, who are known for their incredible skills. Uh, for their leadership, for their knowledge, for their prowess, and they become the person to go to because this is that person who knows how to deal with that problem. Well, today in the Gospel, the angel says to Joseph, you will call him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sin. So when it comes to the problem of sin, there is only one person to go to. It is for this that he came into the world, okay? Uh, St. Paul says in his first letter to Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. St. John in his first epistle said the reason for the appearance of the Son of God was to undo the works of the devil. And here we have the angel of the Lord pronouncing to us, he will save his people from their sins. This is the purpose. Jesus is the one who is able to do that. And that's what makes Christmas and the celebration of Christmas and the whole holiday season very, very rich for us is because we have to be honest about ourselves. Sin is a 
problem for us. It has been since the beginning. God created the world and He declared that it is good. Okay? It's His craftsmanship. His ability. That's what makes God God. He is able to create out of nothing. None of us are able to do that. But God is able to do that by the word He creates. And what He creates is good. Now it's very, very mysterious. The, the problem of iniquity that came into the, the human drama. But the devil who made himself God's adversary, uh, inserted himself into human history and being persuasive and uh, skilled in the art of deception, uh, induced man to sin. And there has been this uh, unfortunate, undesirable um, rift between ourselves and the Creator. And it's created a, a lot of problems for us. Uh, man is wounded. I mean, we are spiritually wounded. I mean, in some ways the Scripture says we are plainly dead. We're spiritually dead because of sin. But, but sometimes it works for us to, to just kind of refer to that, that ongoing soul sickness that we all have. And, and I, I think that, that it's something that we can all relate to. I think it's important that we revisit it, especially when we are seeking to understand and to grow in our knowledge of what Jesus brings to the world and, and what His mission and ministry, his, his coming into the world as man is really all about and why it means so much to us. But, but we are soul sick, right? There is an inexplicable sadness that has characterized the human story uh, since the beginning. There's division, there's miscommunication, there's broken, hurtful relationships, there's toxic situations. We don't always have uh, a positive view of ourselves. We sometimes think of ourselves in such profoundly negative ways that it is not pleasing to God because we do have value that God has given us as a part of His creation. Sometimes we very easily lapse into kind of an unholy, unhealthy self-loathing or towards others we can be very bitter and resentful or we can be uncharitable in our remarks about others. We can participate in gossip. Uh, we, we can be very subtle in the way we pull strings. I mean, we may not even realize it, but, you know, it, it could be that we, we all are just kind of walking around life with our own personal agendas. And in very subtle, perhaps even unconscious ways, we are even manipulating those whom we love and care about the most in order to achieve uh, a kind of end that gives us comfort and, and makes us feel good about ourselves, sometimes to the expense of others. I, I think that this is just what it means to be human. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's stressful, uh, we have appetites that we don't know how to manage, and uh, we do this kind of game playing that can be very destructive, and ultimately it's led to wars and, and greed and, and injustices and, and all these kinds of things in the world that have made it a, a very, very difficult life. Jesus himself was a pawn as a baby, right? And was subject to bad politics and, and the, the vicious, cruel nature of the potentates of his own day. So sin is a problem. It is a difficulty. It's hard to be human. It's hard to be human with other people. And because of our sin and because of the devil's lies, it's very difficult for us to be in friendship with God. And so Jesus is born. In order to address this problem. Now think about that. Little baby boy. Brand new. Right? It's kind of interesting because we are a race of sinners. We are prone to violence in this world. And there are all kinds of things that, that uh, perhaps uh, grew up the, 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 
mechanics of society and life, bad politics, uh, situations that could take something innocent and beautiful and, and turn it into something terrible or uh, abysmal. All these tendencies exist in the world and yet God entrusted his only begotten son into the care of sinful human beings. Jesus in his form as an infant was completely helpless, was completely dependent on human beings for his care and protection. And we know that the Bible is, is full of characters who uh, perhaps in our knowledge of the history and of the lives they led, that they, they are heroic people like Abraham and Jacob and King David and, and all kinds of people in the Old Testament that, that were tremendous heroes, but they were also profoundly afflicted with sin and had to be humbled, uh, had to be taught repentance, had to be brought to their knees in repentance. And also in the New Testament, you have people who are servants of Christ, St. Paul and the Apostles, Paul who attacked Christ's church, Peter who denied knowing Jesus, Judas who betrayed him. But let's, let's go back to that, that scene at the beginning, though, where he's just, just a Having come from a, a genealogy, a family tree, uh, so many problems, so many difficulties. Jesus' ancestors. But here he is in the care of Joseph and Mary. And, and of course, we, we tend to think of Joseph and Mary as very saintly. And, and we should. God chose them to oversee the upbringing of his only begotten son. But let's think of some of the things that they were going through in the context of their own humanity. Think about Joseph. He's a good man, right? Not much negative to say about him. Except at the first sign of trouble, he wanted out immediately. He really wanted to divorce Mary, because he did not know how to deal with this impossible problem of her being pregnant and not by him. We might call that bolting, right? A desire to bolt, man, I'm getting out of this. The angel of the Lord had to intervene in order to reassure Joseph that it would be okay, that he need not fear. But I just wonder if weeks or months later when that baby was born, if Joseph remembered what he had intended to do when he didn't know how to deal with that problem. And I wonder if perhaps maybe he even berated himself. And then I think about what it was like from the perspective of Mary, who again, Scripture gives us every indication that she was sanctified and well chosen by God for the birth of Jesus. But still, she may have been looking at Joseph as she was riding on a donkey toward Bethlehem or perhaps while he was exhausted and sleeping and she was awake or maybe while he was stoking the fire to keep her warm and his thoughts were lost. Could it be that she said, you know what, his life was fine until I got involved. This good man had everything in the world going for him, but then he gets mixed up with me, and now his life is nothing but a people. So even in the context of Jesus' own family, even as he's a baby, there's complications on top of complications and we see and we understand again just how stressful and difficult it is just to keep 
And now we look at our own lives too. We're mixed bags of virtue and vice. And there are times when we feel discouraged or frustrated by things or things aren't really going our way or perhaps we'll even be down on ourselves because of the same old vices that we are always being confronted with. But it's extraordinary to consider that, that Jesus has come into the world in order to address this specific problem, our sin. And if God sends Jesus into the world in order to be the one who saves people from their sins, then we ought to believe that Jesus is more than confident. Jesus is more sufficient to do this. And so as we celebrate this week, the birth of this extraordinary child, human in every way, <coughs> feeling cold, feeling hunger, all these things that are common to newborn babies around the world, right? It's useful for us to remember that it is Him. He is the one. He was given to the world in order to bless the world with a new freedom, a new redemption that rescues us from the problem of our sin. And as long as we are bonded to that child by faith, we are spared the burden of our guilt. Because such is the greatness of his love, he absorbs on himself all the guilt. And even though we are still in a world that is afflicted with sin and, and difficulty and everything that, that can easily discourage us, we know because this same child suffered our mortality. He suffered and died an invisible death and was thrown into a dark tomb, but then he re-emerged alive again. That is the reassurance that we are given that we too will live beyond the grave and be with him forever in heaven. And in that heavenly setting, there is no devil to persuade us into sin. And there is no guilt and there is no shame. We will experience a quality of humanity that because of the devil and because of sin in this world, we simply cannot experience yet. But when we are there with Jesus and liberated from all these things, it will feel so good to be human. And we will be so full of rejoicing that we were born. And we will experience that comfort and joy that will animate our hearts as we celebrate the birth of Jesus this week. And in our prayers today, we are going to remember uh, Jim and uh, Barb Azell, who had innumerable health issues this year, including during the course of this last night. Barb was at the ER for many hours because of blood pressure issues. Also, Jody Bauer has asked that we pray for her sister-in-law uh, who just lost her mother. Please rise. of our crooked and twisted generation. Give us strength to shine as lights in the world as we live out our baptismal life by serving our neighbors with thanksgiving and joy as sacrificial offerings of mercy and love. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our offering.
Please rise for the service of the sacrament. My friends, the Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us in giving your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith and above all firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath, from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine, that is, his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, to you alone, O Father, be our glory, honor, and worship of the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.